What is up, everybody? Welcome into another episode of the Two Stripes Podcast, the college football podcast that has seven five-star reviews on iTunes because I will steal my friends' phones and do nothing but put myself over. My name is Colton Denning, and I am your host, coming to you from Boulder, Colorado, beautiful Boulder, Colorado, on Tuesday, April 18th, 2017. Hope all of you had a phenomenal start to your week, and want to thank you for taking the time to listen to today's show. Of course, if you want to go back and listen to any of the old Two Straps podcast episodes, you can do so by going to soundcloud.com slash two straps pod or going to iTunes, searching the Two Straps podcast. There you can find all of the old episodes, leave a review, leave a comment, leave feedback, anything that can help me help make this show better and more accessible to you, the college football fan, always helps me. So please give me the feedback if you listen to the show, positive or negative is greatly encouraged. So have a fun episode today. Maybe the most fun one I've recorded in almost a year of doing this podcast. I spoke with UCLA football reporter Tuk Nien Nguyen of the Southern California News Group and InsideSoCal.com about UCLA football. And there's a lot of interesting stuff going on with the Bruins heading into 2017. We spent a lot of time talking about the offense. Of course, quarterback Josh Rosen returns from his season-ending injury six games into last year and how he's going to be able to bounce back, especially with his third offensive coordinator in three years, this year, of course, being Jed Fish coming over from Michigan and how their offense is going to rebound after it played really poorly, especially that running game, which was one of the worst in the country in 2016. So spent a lot of time breaking down the offense and how some of those pieces, most of whom are all back from last season, fit into what Jed Fish wants to do on offense and how they've looked so far in spring ball. We also talked a lot about the new look defense and how UCLA is going to replace all of the production that they lost from last season's team in the form of Fabian Moreau, edge rusher Tack McKinley, the Pac-12's leading tackler and Jayon Brown and a few other names. So a lot of new faces on that defense. And it's going to be interesting to see how some of those younger guys, a lot of whom were blue chip recruits, step up into those roles. And if they're going to be able to keep UCLA's defense at the level or close to what it was last season. We also brought up expectations for 2017 with the Bruins' tough schedule, how people perceive Jim Mora and the way that he stands up for his players, and then maybe most importantly, a quick discussion about UCLA's jerseys and the famous shoulder stripe. So let's get right into it. Here is Tukni Nguyen talking all things UCLA football. So joining me to talk all things UCLA football and make this podcast 1% better today is Tuk Ni Nguyen. She covers UCLA football for the Southern California News Group on InsideSoCal.com. How are you doing today? Thanks for joining the show as well. I am doing great. How are you? I'm doing well. Ready to talk UCLA football. And like I feel like whether it's on a national level or listening to college football podcasts or any media talking about UCLA the biggest story or the leadoff story is always going to be about Josh Rosen, and rightfully so, going into his third season, coming off injury, and probably his, his last season at UCLA before he gets to the NFL. But I want to get to him in a little bit and get your thoughts and perspective on being around the UCLA football program, because right now, at least from afar, it feels like uncertainty is the biggest word to associate with UCLA football, given that it's the third offensive coordinator in three years. The offense really struggled last year, especially with the running game. And then you have six starters leaving that defense from last year and coming off a four and eight season. It seems like everything is up in the air. Would, would that be kind of how you describe what UCLA football feels like right now? Yeah. Yeah. Uncertainty is a good word. Um, I think the offense, it's kind of same candy, different rapper. It's, One year later, it's kind of the same feeling. They don't know what's going to happen. They have a new offensive coordinator. Josh Rosen is still who he is, but he is coming off that injury. We haven't seen him in a while. And they have a lot of the same pieces from last year. So it's it's not like they have, on offense at least, 
a brand new face that's going to change everything. They have pretty much the same offensive linemen. They have the same running backs, pretty much the same receivers. The only things that are changing is the coaching staff. So it really comes down to how big of an impact the coaching staff can have. And they have four new offensive coaches, starting with new offensive coordinator Jed Fish, who came from Michigan last year. So it's a lot of uncertainty. Still, I think a lot of confusion, probably a lot staying from last year, just how a team as talented as last year could have ended up at four and eight. So I think as they go through spring ball, there's a lot of just kind of waiting. I, I think the fans are are just waiting to see. They don't want to get too excited and then get burned again like they were last year when a lot of people were talking about Pac-12 championship. Josh Rosen, for one, said national championship. And then look where they ended up. They ended up going home in November. Looking at some of those changes, and, and one of the defining things, maybe the most defining thing about their offense last year was having one of the worst running games in the country. And in the first couple of weeks of spring camp, what have you kind of seen and heard from the coaching staff as well as the players about trying to revamp that running game? And I think they have all five of those backs from last year back on the team. But what about the offensive line? Because that, that too has kind of seemed like a theme under Jim Moore, maybe more so pass protection in the Brett Hundley era. But now with just no push they were able to get in the running game last year, what have they kind of said in the first couple of weeks of spring practice about trying to fix the running game? Yeah, fixing the running game is obviously um, kind of mission number one for the offense. You cannot win a game with no running attack. They were 127th out of 128 teams last year. The only team I think worse was, I believe, Texas State, which is not good company for UCLA to be keeping. So kind of a problem with the running game last year was, one, the offensive line and kind of the way that they were used. The offensive line was not meant to play in a phone booth they they weren't supposed to they weren't built to kind of play that downhill power running game that Kennedy Palomalu wanted them to play they were recruited under Noel Noel Mazzoni who ran a spread spread zone kind of blocking scheme and that's what kind of all those players were meant for and then Kennedy Palomalu he was kind of an old school running back he used to be a fullback so he wanted to play this physical in a phone booth you know, hat on a hat, just smash people. And that didn't work. That was not who they were. So under Jed Fish, something I've noticed so far in the first two weeks is that when they run, is when the team runs now, they're trying to more run outside, move the pocket a little bit, take the stress off that offensive line. Because, again, there's not, there are not any new faces that are going to save that line. There's still the, it's still the same guys, the same dudes that still couldn't, get any push last year so it's kind of hard to expect that they'll be getting any more push this year so they're trying to take the stress off the offensive line and change the scheme a little bit to kind of fit their personnel a little bit more getting into Josh Rosen in the passing game you talked about this being third offensive coordinator in three years another new system in Jed Fish and it seems like the playbook is pretty thick and there's a lot to learn for not only the offense but Rosen as, as the leader of that offense what has his comfort level been like in learning and adjusting to another new system, especially one that seems like th there's a lot going on with it? From everything that we've heard so far, things are going well in terms of learning the offense. I think it seems like every day maybe they kind of add a new page, add a new page. We see new plays kind of um, unfolding every day at practice. But even if they add a new page every day of spring practice, that's only 15 pages of the thing. So, and it's, it's the playbook has said to be extremely thick. So there's a lot of learning left to do in the summer just with the players by themselves. But in terms of Josh Rosen learning it, if there's one thing Josh Rosen is, it's he's smart. So he is very capable of learning an offense as complicated as the one Jed Fish is supposed to be bringing in. So I don't think it's going to be a problem for him in terms of just putting it into his mind and internalizing that in terms of taking good notes in, in the meeting rooms and watching film and breaking it down. I think he's going to be really good at that. The only problem is when it gets to season and, you know, the clock's ticking, lights are on, fans are there watching, it might take a little bit of time to actually get up to game speed and get the brain working at the same pace as the feet. So we'll have to wait until the fall to see how that goes. 
So flipping to the defensive side of the ball, it seems like that UCLA offense is going to have to carry, obviously, much more weight than they did last season because the defense only returns about 40% of its production from last season. That's good for 120th nationally. And with players like Tack, McKinley gone, Jayon Brown gone, Randall Goforth, Fabian Moreau, Eddie Vanderdoss, and others, what's the defense look like in spring ball so far? What are, what are some of the new faces that have stood out and how much adjustment have they made to kind of shifting to a new era of this defense? Yeah, I think going into the season, I thought that, or going into the spring, I thought that the offense would definitely have to carry a little bit more weight considering how strong the defense was last year. But when I look at this defense now, I'm kind of, I'm impressed by the depth they be, they've built. They have plenty of guys ready to step up. And so I, I don't think the defense will take as much of a step back as a lot of people are anticipating. So the defensive line is probably the strongest unit that they have on their team right now. And that's saying a lot considering that they lost 75% of their starters. So they have Boss Tagaloa, who is a rising true sophomore. He's from De La Salle and he plays on the inside. He's really, really talented. Of course, De La Salle is a very storied high school program. He was the first player ever to play varsity football as a freshman at that high school. So that's a pretty big accomplishment already. So it speaks a lot to the, his talent. And he's definitely um, going to be a starter this year. He played in all 12 games off the bench last year. I think Josh Woods at linebacker is ready for a big year. He's stepping into Jayon Brown's outside linebacker role. And Josh Woods is, he's a 19 year old junior. So he's kind of had so much athleticism for so many years, but he's really young. So they were just kind of waiting for him to grow into his body and kind of mature. And I think that might, this might be his time. A lot of the coaches say one day he'll be a really good player for us one day. Maybe that day is coming for him this year. And then in the secondary, they brought in a five-star corner from Calabasas High School, Darnay Holmes. He was U.S. Army All-American. And I expect him to, to, if not start, at least play significant time at corner kind of replacing Fabian Moreau. So they have plenty of guys ready to step up and in every place that they lost starters. So I'm really impressed with what the coaching staff has done in terms of kind of having a contingency plan on that side of the ball. Staying with the secondary, they were one of the best teams in the country last year at limiting explosive plays. I want to say that they were second in the nation behind only like Nevada and 20 giving up 20 yards or more of pass plays and now with Fabian Moreau and Randall Goforth gone you mentioned Darnay Holmes that's probably going to step into one of those roles since he's so talented what are some other names to look for in the secondary as they look to kind of retool losing two very good players so after after Darnay he's he's an early enrollee so he's already on campus they have four more freshman corners who are coming in and they probably won't all get playing time, but I believe Elijah Gates might might try um, to break the lineup. I think he might get some playing time in the secondary just to build some depth. But the kind of replacement for Randall is Adarius Pickett. He's going to be a redshirt junior. He's out of Richmond, California, and he played a lot last year. I think he was one of kind of the stars of the secondary last year outside of Fabian, and he's a extremely hard hitting safety. He's, he's the tone setter of, of that unit. It, he's kind of, he's very much inspired by Cam Chancellor of the Seattle Seahawks. So in practice, he wears that, that dark visor that Cam always wears in games. And he's, he wants to just smack people. If they come over the middle, he's coming for you like a missile. So definitely look out for him. He's a great playmaker. He has great ball skills. He's a, he was a very talented baseball player. His dad was a minor league baseball player. So he has very good ball skills. If you're throwing the ball to him or in his vicinity, good luck because he's, he's coming for it. He's trying to pick it off. Uh, Nate Metters has had a really good spring camp. He started a lot as a true freshman. Now he's coming up. Now he's going to be a junior. So he's kind of locked down that other corner spot. And Nate, last year, one of kind of the – unfortunate moments of a pretty good secondary was when they gave up the game losing touchdown to Stanford with about 40 seconds left. Nate was on on defense there and it's kind of a the B 
feast famine of that position. He had a really good game, but the only thing that people remember from it, from that Stanford game, is when he gave up that that losing touchdown. So even though he doesn't always make the play kind of when he needed to last year, I think now as a junior, he's ready to step up and be that top corner now that Fabian's gone. They've signed some really talented players the last three recruiting cycles in Kaishan Lucier South, Deshaun Holiday in 2015, Mike Juarez and Boss Tagaloa, who you mentioned, and Breland Brandt in 2016, and now with Jalen Phillips and Darnay Holmes being their two most talented or at least most heralded recruits in this year's class. Through that 2015 and 16 class, though, they really haven't gotten much production from really any of those guys. How much of that can be attributed to all the players that we talked about that are leaving and just not having an open spot and playing? Or is there a sense of that this coaching staff may not be able to develop those high-end players as much as you would like? I would think that what people are feeling right now is that it more leans on the coaching staff. I think part of it is just when you're when you're dealing with kids this young, 17, 18, coming out of high school, you never know how they're really going to develop, you know? So it, it's a very extensive guessing game, and so you're always going to miss a few of them. But for UCLA to miss on so many guys is, is kind of puzzling, you know? You would think that a program as good as UCLA, as storied as UCLA, in terms of just the school and the campus and the location, you'd be able to get some really good guys and get them to produce for you. Um, so I think it, it's definitely leaning a lot on the coaching staff to find these good players and develop them really well. I think they've kind of fallen short on that in some respects. Some of the guys you mentioned, like Keyshawn Lusher South, he he came in as a as a five star, but he didn't quite have the body to play college football yet. So he's still trying to gain some weight and work on his body to get uh, to where he needed he needs to be. I think last year he was he was weighing maybe 225 or something, and his target weight is about 255. So he still has a long way to go physically. And he was only a redshirt freshman last year. And Deshaun Holiday is actually, he's actually kind of one of the surprises of spring camp, or he was. He recently hurt his shoulder, so he's out for at least a week, but he was moved from the safety position to the linebacker position. And he's actually, before he got hurt, he was competing for one of the starting linebacker jobs. So I wouldn't write Deshaun Holiday off as kind of a flop yet. Hopefully he can come back from his shoulder uh, injury soon and he'll be healthy because he was actually having a really great spring camp at the linebacker position. What's the feeling with, and and you mentioned kind of how it has fallen on the coaching staff, what's the feeling of the fan base with Jim Moore and his staff? I know that Tom Bradley's been able to kind of revitalize that defense and really make them sort of more of an attacking defense under Moore. But it it seems like there's a lot of unrest from UCLA fans heading into the season. Would that be fair to assess it that way? Yeah, yeah, I think unrest is a good word. I think last year, the way it went, he did not win over many fans. From what I understand of before last year, he, he was still pretty popular among the fans, even as the players, or not the players, the the team was kind of, wilting a little bit because two years ago they finished eight and five which was at that time the worst the worst finish in the Mora era and I think even though they finished eight and five that year fans were ready to kind of jump off the bandwagon they were okay accepting that get that season as maybe just an anomaly or something but then last year when they finished four and eight I think they fans start to really look at Jim Mora and say why why isn't he getting any better? Did he peak too early? Uh, he has all of his own players now. These are players he picked, he found, he chose, and he still can't win. And it's very frustrating for the fans to watch. And also, Mora can be a little bit, uh, I guess, maybe moody is the right word. So, a little, yeah. <laughs> so sometimes if you sometimes if you watch certain press conferences, especially after games, especially after games he loses, he doesn't come off very well. And at those moments, a lot of fans are going to be watching and a lot of fans aren't going to be pleased with the demeanor that their head coach is putting on. So yeah, I I think fans are are a little uneasy. There was a lot of kind of uh, uproar about 
firing Mora last year. I don't think that was that was going to happen at all um, just because he has a giant buyout. It's probably, I think it's like $14 million. So that, that wasn't something that was going to happen, but I, I did hear a few fans calling for it. It was probably a very vocal minority though. Definitely see that stuff with more. I want to say it was on signing day on ESPN when Joey Galloway said something about Josh Rosen and he like really jumped down his throat. And I think if, if like you're, you're like me and, not around that program every single day. It's kind of weird to see that, but it seems like it pops up every, like once or twice a year where Jim Moore like really rubs somebody the wrong way, and you're like, "Wow, he's he's agitated." I I did not expect that. Yeah, yeah, I would say that. I think the the thing about Mora is that he very much stands behind his players, so his players love him. His players are loyal to him because he's loyal to his players. So. On signing day, when Joey Galloway kind of led into the sequ- his segment by saying Josh Rosen needs to play better, Mora kind of took that as he was attacking his player, like he was attacking one of his, you know, his sons, you could say. And so he wanted to defend Josh. And so I could, I could see if I was a player, I would love that. I would really, really want that in a coach. But when, it, when you're not a player, when you're on the outside of the program, you look at that as a as a coach, just like kind of coming out swinging for no reason. So it kind of puts you, puts you on guard. Well, and before we get into 2017 and since we're on the topic of Rosa right now, it's, it's so hard to assess his season last year because of the injury, but even before then, and, and maybe the most defining moment to me was the Texas A&M game where he threw three interceptions. He made some really incredible passes but also some head scratchers and just reading some of your practice reports too, the interceptions have still kind of popped up early in spring ball. How much of a concern is there that that's still one of kind of the defining traits of his game that, yeah, he's, he's very smart. He can make a lot of high caliber throws, but turning the ball over still remains his biggest problem or one of his biggest problems. Yeah. He might be kind of a, a big risk, big reward kind of guy. I could see that. I think it was really unfortunate for Josh to get hurt at all last year, but especially at the time that he did, because he got hurt in the sixth game of the year, which was Arizona State, and the previous game before that was Arizona, and that was his best game of the year. And that was kind of when he really started turning that corner, and the the entire offense was kind of turning the corner with him. And then he gets hurt the next game, and boom, it's, it's done. It's over. And so, you know, valiant effort by backup Mike Faithful, but without Josh Rosen, that, that season wasn't going anywhere. But in terms of just Josh throwing interceptions, I think last year, it was, it was just kind of a little bit of immaturity. He was, he was only a sophomore. I don't exactly know how old he is, but let's say 19, 20 at that time. And he, he had a few moments where he, he thought he was better than everyone else. And so he thought that, oh, I can get it over this DB right here, I can do it. And the DB out jumped him and he was like, oh, I didn't know he had that. So I think as he kind of goes into his junior year, he'll start to realize that there are a lot of other really, really, really talented people who can make plays just like he can make plays. And I mean, throwing in throwing interceptions in practice, I'm, I'm trying to think of the ones he did recently. I feel like they were just some really great plays by, by the defense. He had a one terrible one the one last week though that was not a good that was not a good throw but um, yeah I, I think right now it's in practice at least it's only two weeks into the new system it's just kind of working out some of the kinks. Okay, so before I, I ask you about expectations for the 2017 season, we're going to get a little off topic here, and maybe this isn't even a thing. How happy are you to not have to hear from UCLA fans about the shoulder straps on the jerseys this year? Is that even a thing? Oh, well, we don't know, we don't know what the jerseys are going to be like. So they, they may switch them again. Yeah, because UCLA has a new, a new clothing deal with Under Armour starting July 1st, 2017. So I have no idea. If Under Armour changes and they don't put the shoulder stripes, my inbox is going to be on fire. <laughs> so I'm, I am hoping that they put the shoulder stripes on there so I don't have to hear about it because it's not fun. I'll tell you that. Yeah, I only ask because I, I see it from like UCLA fans on Twitter and, and online. And like, to be honest, as a Jersey, jersey slob myself, like it makes me mad. And I'm not even a UCLA fan. So hopefully with Under Armour, they, they get that switch. But getting into the 2017 season, uh, it's season that starts off with the game against Texas A&M. And good luck to the losing coach 
and that game yeah. after that one. And then trips to Stanford, Washington, Utah, and SC. Given everything we've talked about with the uncertainty at offense, another new offensive coordinator, a run game that was really bad last year and brings back all the same pieces for the most part, and then replacing so much on defense, what do you think is a reasonable expectation for 2017 for UCLA? I, I think a low bowl game is a reasonable expectation. I do expect them to be bowl eligible. I think four and eight, it was just was an extreme, extreme anomaly. It was this really weird, perfect storm of terrible, terrible things all happening at the same time. So I don't expect them to be as bad as they were last year. I think the defense will be just as good, if not maybe better than it was last year. I think the offense will improve just because I think the scheme is a little smarter just to maximize the personnel a little bit more. So I think the offense will take a little bit of a step forward. The defense will stay the same. And when you add those things together, they'll get there. They'll they'll get a few more wins. And Josh Rosen is worth at least maybe two or three wins just on his own. And that's being modest. All right. So final one. Do you think that if UCLA doesn't go to a bowl game again, or even if they do go to a low-level bowl, what do you think the odds are that Jim Moore is the head coach in 2018? Um, I think I, I still think pretty high. And I think that's a a result of the contract that he signed. I mean, I don't have it right in front of me, but I, he signed a contract extension before last year. I think he signed it in July last year and it signed him, I believe, off the top of my head, maybe through 2021, 2022, something like that. So he's roped in for quite a while and UCLA tied a lot of money into him. So it would take a pretty, pretty disastrous year to to fire him right now. Yeah, it would just take it would just take a lot a lot, a lot, a lot of losing to fire him this year. And I don't think they're going to quite, quite reach that level of, uh, of mediocrity, something worse than mediocrity. Well, you heard it here first. UCLA should be very fun to watch and keep up with. And if you want to keep up with UCLA, you can do so by following all of Tukni Nguyen's work at the Southern California News Group. You go to InsideSoCal.com. You can also find her on Twitter at Tukni21. That's T-H-U-C-N-H-I 21. Please don't email her about the shoulder strap. She doesn't want to hear about it regardless of what happens. But if you want to follow all you all of her work, do so on Twitter and at InsideSoCal.com. Tukni, want to thank you for joining the show. It was a lot of fun. I appreciate it. Yeah, thanks for having me. Anytime. Right. Even managed to sneak some uniform talk in there at the end, but it should be a hell of a lot of fun to see UCLA on the field this year. That was a lot of fun to record and learn more about the UCLA Bruins. Want to thank Tukni Nguyen for joining the show. Please go support all of her work by going to InsideSoCal.com slash UCLA. Over there, you can find all of her writings on the UCLA Bruins. And then also go on Twitter and follow her at Tukni21. That's T-H-U-C-N-H-I-21. Big shout out to her for joining the show and dropping knowledge on the UCLA Bruins. That's pretty much going to wrap it up for this show, though. want to thank everybody who listened, who downloaded. Uh, if you want to check out any of the old episodes, be sure to go on SoundCloud.com slash Two Stripes Pod. Also, go to iTunes, search two stripes podcast and over there you can subscribe leave a review leave any questions if you like the podcast if you don't like the podcast any sort of feedback helps me and whatever i can do to make this better for you the college football fan is what i aim to do to make this one of the best college football podcasts out there so please if you have any sort of feedback on the podcast let me know. And you can also send me a tweet at Dubsco. That's D-U-B-S-C-O. I'll be back later this week with another show. Probably going to stick in the Pac-12, so be on the lookout for that later on in the week. Hope to talk to you guys then. And want to thank you one final time for listening to the show. If you like it, tell a friend. That's it for me, though. My name is Colton Denning, and this has been the Two Stripes Podcast. <laughs>